Welcome to our panel discussion, where we will discuss representation in entertainment and the media. My name is DJ Kurz, and I'm the Artistic Director at Deaf West Theatre. And we are here today to talk about some new research that we have published. Deaf West has worked in collaboration with NRG, a top researching firm, also involved in strategic consulting. Together, we're publishing this new study about deaf representation in the media. And to do so, we have a fantastic group of people who themselves all work in the entertainment industry and are deaf advocates. So we have a lot to talk about here today. Let's just dive right in. Obviously, we're getting together here because we have been seeing more deaf people on stage and on screen. In fact, our research does show this. 79% of deaf consumers say they have seen more representation of deaf people in the media as compared to a year ago. So Lauren, let me start with you. You began as an actor, now you're moving into production. Can you compare what things are like right now to before? Yeah, when they say strike when the iron's hot, I think it's happening right now. Really, there's a boom happening right now in regards to deaf representation on the screen. Things are changing quite fast since six years ago, almost six years since I started to be a part of this industry. And I remember the first piece of advice that I received from another celebrity actor. When I first started, I was a bit hesitant if I wanted to pursue acting. And this actor said, truly, you know, it's hard. It has been really hard. There haven't been many of us. And I'm so glad to see that things are changing and have been. And now I feel like we are working on going deeper not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Shaley, let me ask you as a, a, a rising star, what does this change mean to you? And what has it meant to your career? Yes, I do see an increase of deaf roles since I've been acting. But again, I would ask how many of these are a starring role? Or how many deaf actors have their own show? Or where the story is centered around the deaf character? Or what about more deaf people behind the camera? I love acting, but would really like to see more pivotal roles available to deaf actors. And I guess other deaf actors would like that too. Daniel, of course, people know you from your role in CODA. And 66% of our deaf respondents said that CODA had a positive effect on the representation of deaf people in the media. So my question for you is, what do you think going forward can be done to increase that positive representation of deaf people in the media? Really, I'm, I'm so glad that CODA happened because it showed the world that they were, deaf people aren't something to pity. The CODA movie showed that we have our own culture. It's a strong thing. In a deaf family's house, we're all so close together. And we had a CODA there, who was a hearing child with deaf parents. And you could see the influence of that deaf family. And it was also cool. And it showed strong ASL, beautiful ASL with direction. So with the captions along with the visual ASL, let the audience see. It wasn't like hands were just flying over the screen. You could see the visual sign language and it hit the hearing audience. And that's what really sign language is about and what sign language means. And we were cast authentically. At first, CODA, when they started production, they planned to have hearing big name actors to act as deaf characters. But production said no, and it was a big fight. And then we finally hired authentic deaf actors and we made the movie and it's become successful and they won the Oscars. And it's really nice to show the world why it's so important to cast authentically. It's really a beautiful time. We are seeing more deaf people in the media, but the research is actually showing something very important that when it comes to deaf people on stage and on screen, we are not really reflecting the full diversity of the deaf community. We are incredibly diverse in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of, of socioeconomic status, in terms of how we communicate with each other and with hearing people. For example, our study actually showed that in the United States, hearing people were more than twice as likely to see a white deaf person represented in the media than a deaf person of color. So, Raven, let me ask you this. Um, you, of course, appear as a contestant on the reality show, uh, The Circle. 
let me ask you, what is your what is your view of all this? How can we do better? How can we better show the true diversity of deaf people in the media? Watching the show, I didn't see, specifically for that game show, I didn't see anyone that looked like me as a deaf person or as a black deaf woman. And many times when we look at these TV shows, these reality game shows, they're already created to not be accessible to the deaf community. And that's because they're not thinking about us, to be honest. When they're making these games and planning out the shows, we are not who they have in mind to be a cast member. So it's not that these shows can't be accessible. It just requires willingness and creativity and accepting of feedback. Raven, I'm just going to come back to you for one other uh, specific question here. Um, this is about your experience before you were even on The Circle, just as a, as a deaf person, seeing deaf people portrayed on screen, how can we better show the full diversity of our community? When I'm watching, and this is just me, but when I'm watching a deaf person on the screen, typically the storyline is about them being deaf. And I feel that you can't normalize something if it's not made normal. Like, it should just be fine to watch a game show, a dating show, or whatever, and seeing someone there that's deaf. Are they there because they're deaf? No, they're there because they're in a competition and want to win money, just like their hearing counterparts are on the show for. And so I think that when we have deaf people on the screen and we see their storyline being about them struggling to lip read or struggling in whatever it may be, that it's feeding into the misconceptions that are already fed to our communities that we have these boring lives and stay home when we don't. We party, we sing, we dance, we act. We are in these competition shows, right? We flirt, we do all of that just like everyone else. And so we always see hearing people do that. Now it's time to show that disabled people do the same thing. And that would help people break down their misconceptions that they have learned all of their lives. And so if we continue to show that narrative on the screen, it'll continue to feed that misconception that they have about us. If you don't mind, I would like to add on in terms of what you were just saying in regards to how the reality shows portray people or how deaf people can be. I feel like reality shows are almost like a gateway, truly a gateway. And I feel like since Niall DeMarco entered into that space on America's Next Top Model, that was a gateway. It opened the floodgates. It opened up the world of deaf people. And then people at home started watching and becoming quite curious because reality TV is about the real world, so to speak. And to see people like yourself there in that space, that's where we see a, that breakthrough happens, like who that first trans person is, who that first deaf person, deaf black person, so on and so forth. And I think it's really important to feel that that actually, you know, leads on to different things, whether it's TV, movies, and if not, and you now being a part of that, you're opening a lot more doors for those other people. Lauren, let me ask you, as the first deaf superhero, you appeared, of course, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of your appearing in this film as compared to what came before you for deaf characters on screen? You know, that is a loaded question, right? <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, I mean, it is a huge honor and it's a huge responsibility. Becoming the first deaf superhero within the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it really gives me an opportunity to redefine how people portray and perceive deaf people. I recently was just involved with a foundation who their campaign is disability is diversity. And oftentimes a lot of people, when they talk about diversity, they forget about the disabled community. And within that is the deaf community. So I was thrilled to be able to be a part of that and be a, in a, a role that gives people the opportunity to explore what it means to be disabled. If you've seen the movie, my character, Makari, she is deaf, obviously, but 
It's not about that at all. It's about what she's able to do, what she can do, not about what she can't do. And I feel like that's so much more powerful in storytelling, you know, a storytelling tool to use. And I feel that just having a symbolic representation is really truly just about Makari. It's not necessarily about that, but it's about having that symbol of deafness as strength, as an advantage. It really impacts so many different people, not just deaf people, but also people who have been marginalized or people that just don't see themselves within the mythology that we call the MCU. Jessica. Jessica. Yes, you. All right, bring it on. So deaf people communicate in diverse ways, and you use your platform to really focus on this. Can you talk a little bit about why this is so important for you and for other people to understand? Well, there are already a lot of assumptions out there about us, and growing up, I had to experience those firsthand, you know. Everyone assumed that I could hear everything, or because I wore hearing aids, I could lip-read anyone, or they automatically assumed that because I was deaf, I would sign. But if they knew my background, they would know that I grew up speaking like a hearing person, you know, really. I could fake it, you know, and it was a hard, tough journey for me growing up. So later in my life, I decided to share my stories and came to this realization that, wow, our deaf community is incredibly diverse, which I didn't really know. As I began to understand, I wanted to share this information with others that our community at its heart is so diverse. And for me, this is so important because the more we all have access to sharing and showing our life stories, our diversity, our varied backgrounds in film or television or whatever medium it may be, the more that we can dispel these myths that people have. You know, it just comes down to that people are not exposed enough. For example, if you look at us as a panel today, we all sign so differently. But the audience out there watching may assume that our signing, our grammar, our sign choices and style are the same. That means they don't have adequate exposure. They think sign language is moving hands and they don't recognize its linguistic diversity or even know that sign language is not universal. There's Mexican sign language, British sign language, American sign language. So I'd really love ultimately to see exposure of this diversity of the community out there because it's beautiful. You know? Yeah, it's beautiful. So uh, to date, when we look at representations of deaf people in the media, the research is showing what we're really not seeing very much of is deaf people in video games, books, live shows, and in genres like science fiction and uh, in animation. We just aren't seeing as many deaf people there as we are in other forms of media and other genres. So, Shaley, let me ask you, as someone who's been involved in an animated show, and actually you were credited as the first deaf voiceover artist in your show, which is very cool, um, can you tell us a little bit about all of this and why it's important to find deaf people in other forms of media and genres? Well, when I was in the movie Noel, I was only eight years old, and that was my first acting job and I really fell in love with it at the time. But looking back, I really questioned if I could continue acting, because growing up, I never saw young deaf kids like me on screen. So I think it's very important that there's more representation of young deaf people in children's TV, shows, or movies, because child audiences out there are more open, receptive, and welcoming. If they see deaf children are a part of our world, they will realize there's nothing wrong with being deaf. And through this representation, audiences will see that deaf children have many different interests and like different genres and have preferences for movies or TV shows. So I think it's really important to have a few deaf characters in every genre because then everyone's varied interests would be represented, right? You know, I definitely agree with what you just said. It's very important that we actually see that diversity within the deaf characters that we see in the media. 
And I also feel that part of that comes from the deaf community itself, feeling like we want to see themselves. And oftentimes in the past, I've seen how the community responds to that content that they see. And many times in the past, there's a mixture of pride and disappointment. A lot of them say, that's not me on the screen. But, you know, we don't really think that the real problem is the actor's choice in the way that they sign or the way that the director chooses and how they sign and representation itself. But the problem is, is there not enough content? Yeah. There just needs to be more content. As you said earlier, we need more deaf representation in every genre, in different kinds of representation. And the more that we see and the more representation that we see, the more acceptance we will see of diversity within the deaf community. All the responsibility cannot be put on one film, right? One deaf character cannot represent the entirety of the deaf exactly. experience. I think it's helpful to look at it from the perspective of other marginalized communities and the films that they make. I'm part of the queer community. And when you look at queer cinema, it's all been the same story of white people coming out for years. But there's so much more to it. Right, We have BIPOC stories, Black queer stories, stories about different topics that are not just about coming out, stories about family, stories about everything. So we see that it's not just one superficial idea. There's the depth and the breadth of the fullness of people's lives. And that's what I hope for from deaf content as well. It's like you were saying before, we just need to make more. We just need to make more of it. That's yeah, it. Yeah, the good culture. movies, the bad movies, <laughs> the funny TV yes. shows, the terrible shows. We need yes. everything. Yes. Yeah. Right. And part of this means that the deaf community yeah. needs to support the film. I mean, Coda proved that you can have an award-winning film that is financed, that gets financing, that has deaf characters. It's done. It's proved. But what are we going to do with it? What's next? What are we going to do? How are we going to build on that now? We have to build on that, and we need the deaf community to support it. It's also about starting at the top. And, you know, we have to go all the way up the top, the, up to that table where, you know, now I have a seat at that table, you know, around with those typical white men that make those executive decisions, those hearing white men. And just to look different, I do look different. And we need more deaf people in executive positions, making decisions before production even happens, before pre-production even happens. Just when we actually have that slight nugget of an idea, we need a deaf person there because then there, that deaf person is an expert on what that story needs and what kind of acting skills, what kind of people you need to bring in to staff it. You know, as you mentioned, you know, with the crew, you are so right. You know, Hollywood has that, you know, inclusive writer, and they have had that for since 2016, I believe. And that writer says that that actors who sign on can require and request 50 percent, at least 50 percent of the crew is diverse. And it's not exactly happening thus far. And how many of those crew members are deaf? So now, my personal experience as one of the executive producers, you know, is eye opening, truly. And it's terrifying, you know, who we actually reached out to for support and, you know, experts and get insight as, you know, executive, deaf executive producers. There are not many out there. I haven't seen any and I'm stepping in truly blind and I'm going through this and trying my best and I'm learning along the way. And I think it's really important that people who find themselves to be the first or the only or one of a few get together and share those experiences, information and insight, advice authentically. Because when that's how we can grow and assure that there are authentic you know, stories being told on TV and also on the screen. We've been talking about representation on screen, but we also need to look behind the scenes on the technical side of things. And we did this in our research. We talked about the barriers to entry for employment and 73% of our respondents did say that that was a big issue for them. I know, Michael, you've worked behind the scenes on television shows and in film for many years now. I'd like to know a little bit about your experience facing these barriers to entry and what you've seen from other deaf people trying to get into the industry. I would say that in general, in general, there is a career ladder in Hollywood, 
right, for each department, right? Each department has a production assistant, a PA at the bottom of that ladder. And if you're not hiring a deaf PA, then deaf people aren't really going to have a way to climb that ladder, right? You need to start from the bottom in this job. And so we need to figure out how we can better accommodate deaf production assistants throughout Hollywood. We need to figure out, say, how to, how to have a deaf PA on set who doesn't need to use a walkie, something like that. As for me, when I was a production assistant, I worked with the coordinator on set. We figured out how the job could be made accessible for me. I wasn't going to use the phone to order lunch, for example. And I said, okay, well, I'm not going to do that, but I could handle something else instead. We just played around with the job responsibilities so that I could do my job. I wanted to prove myself, show that I can do it, and it was a very rich experience. And that accommodation is not provided for everyone. And that's a barrier. Another one is union membership. In the entertainment industry, many jobs require union membership. And the process for joining a union is vague at best. They'll typically hire family members or people they already know. So it's very hard if you have a disability. If you don't have a job yet, it's very hard to get that job. You know you want it, but then you need to be in the union also. That's a barrier. So we really need to have a conversation about what we want the future of the entertainment industry to look like and how we can actually achieve that through policy changes, through changes in union rules. Lauren talked about riders. There are different things that we can do. And I appreciate that the entertainment industry is beginning to understand that and we starting to see it, but they're a huge employer. They provide so many jobs. Watch a Marvel movie. Look how long the credits go for on and on and on. That's how many people are employed. But where are the deaf people? There's no reason why there can't be more. So if the entertainment industry really wants to see growth, they need to do it from top to bottom. Actors, writers, directors, sure, they are the face of the entertainment industry and they're important. But we also need producers. We need people behind the scenes who can be advocates for us, who could say, no, this is not acceptable. This is. If you want to hire a deaf actor, well, I can be there to help you find the interpreters or to help you to make the accommodations and to handle each situation as it comes up. That's really important. So those are really the two big changes I, I want to see. Well, in terms of Hollywood in general, what I have found frustrating is it doesn't matter whether you're working in front of the camera or behind the camera, often they'll dismiss us if we don't have a long resume. And they're the ones who are preventing us from actually getting some experience. So if people were open to hiring us, then we could add to our resume, which would help create a bigger group of us who are available for all of these jobs. And then they would realize that we could do it, and it doesn't matter whether you're a disabled person, a BIPOC person, or whatever your identity is, that there should be opportunities for all of us. I say a lot of the times on the topic of diversity, we see a lot of debates, but we still see that the disabled community is left out of that conversation. And you can't talk about diversity and not include disabled people. Because we are part of that diversity, and still we struggle with it. And I think it's interesting how on social media, I will try my best to educate people on that as much as I can. But when it comes to regular employment, I have a master's degree in social work, and I still struggle with finding just a regular dis disability accommodations job or deaf service coordinator job. And then realize that, oh, I was rejected from this job and they hired an interpreter instead. Is that because you didn't want to hire a staff interpreter for me, so you got someone that was able to hear and sign as well, which meant that was easier for you or in your easy way out? At another company, that would be illegal, right? You need to make accommodations, period. We have to really... The entertainment industry is a business, right? It's a company. They have responsibilities to so many people. It is complicated, yes, but they have responsibilities, there's a huge problem with accessibility, and it's a universal problem. It is. But still, we have to put pressure on the entertainment industry. That's what I try to do in my work every day for me. In the area where I can make the most change, I advocate where I can for more accessibility. And I do understand that it's tough, and I know that people are scared, but... 
hey, you got to try. I think that, you know, in the entertainment industry specifically, we have to remember that they're the ones telling stories. And right now, what the entertainment industry is doing is they're telling stories of diversity by putting people in front on the screen. And so what people see is left alone. It's good enough. It's there. They don't see really what's happening behind the scenes. And back to what Shaylee was just talking about in regards to not having a strong enough resume. And I think that goes back to that those entry level jobs. There's, you know, for the most part, the most important part of the industry is really networking. And to network, it means that you need to know people. You need to know somebody. And that requires communication. And I think that goes back to the reason why our deaf, you know, the deaf barriers that we have is because we have a communication barrier. And that makes it harder to network, to know somebody who knows somebody who can get you in the door and start building your resume. And then again, that means we have to go back to the top and change that, you know, those, those policies need to change. I have two thoughts that just came to mind. The first being, let's go back to when we were having our conversation about hiring deaf writers, deaf actors. And I just want to say today, you know, you can't fake it, everyone. You could try, but we would see it. We would be able to notice if a hearing person was hired to act in a deaf person's role. Don't be lazy. Search for that deaf actor in advance before your project starts. You can find us. We're out there. It's possible. I found my community online. They're out there. There's writers. There's directors. There's everyone you need from our own home community. But the thing that I'm recognizing now is that we need more advocates and allies. We need more folks out there who are encouraging others to bring us onto the team who are bringing us in and pulling us up. For example, I was writing a movie and I thought, okay, I'm going to share this with someone who's thinking about starting a company. So I shared my content and I got feedback that was not helpful at all. And honestly, I got two other pieces of feedback that were really awful. One person said, oh, well, Make sure you write it for hearing people. Make sure. And I was like, what? (laughs) Write it for hearing people? What does that mean, first of all? So I was like, okay. And I went to a different person. And she said, write it for hearing white males. And I got that note and I was like, uh, okay, well, I'm not a hearing white male, so. (laughs) But then I went to a different place and made a connection with this woman. And uh, that woman was just amazing. She helped me wake up. She said, ah, I know why they gave you that feedback because the people on top are typically hearing white males, obviously. So. That's why you were given that feedback. So just keep doing what you're doing, Jessica, and write with clarity. That's all. Just keep doing that. So I was like, thank God. So relieved I finally met someone who could give me back some hope. But I really think that we need more advocates, more allies out there for sure people who already have experience within the industry to help bring us on in to the inside and to give us feedback, helpful feedback, mind you, to get us where we need to go. And that will help so much because we have all these barriers and obstacles that we need to overcome. But if someone can help pave those inroads, we will be able to thrive so much faster. And if I could just add something here. We can't just have allies because allies can retire or change jobs, etc. We have to address the core issue, which is that some hearing people have a bias and getting rid of that bias and what that means in the working world. We have to add structure because the issue with an unstructured environment is that it typically leans towards the hearing person's decision. Uh, If we have a company with excellent structure, and they can make access happen, then good things happen. 
For example, I live in Washington, D.C., and the federal government is very good at providing this. They're not perfect, but you can go through the appropriate channels to get the access you need. For the entertainment industry, it's more unstructured. To your point, a production assistant, how do you give structure to that when it's not there to begin with? If an everyday organization has the structure there and they can get every person involved, then that works. It can't be individual. For example, there's a movie called Zootopia and it shows inclusion of all the animals of different shapes and sizes. And that's the goal of the company is to be inclusive of all people, including people with disabilities. So we all work in the entertainment industry, but we are also all consumers and we do all face issues when it comes to accessibility. So Raven, let me ask you, you are a performer, um, you're on social media and you're a deaf advocate. So, so let me ask, what does accessibility mean to you? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. True accessibility is not a one size fits all. What's an accommodation for me might not be an accommodation for all of you here in this space. And when it comes to the ADA, it can be pretty vague and it has a lot of loopholes in it. Cause I can say I need an ASL interpreter and the response could be, no, we'll give you captions. You're good. <laughs> no, I said I need an ASL interpreter because when it comes to the vocabulary in English, I do not got it. You know, I'll be like asking someone, what does this mean? Or pulling up a dictionary quick, fast, and in a hurry to look up the meaning of something. And so when a person asks for a certain accommodation, follow it. And it can't even just be superficially just having an ASL interpreter. Because that was one of the main reasons I had picked for black ASL interpreters to come with me on the show because it was deeper than just the ability to sign and voice ASL. It had to do with culture, AAVE, how I signed and how I spoke and used my body language and expressed my language. And so if I just had a random ASL interpreter, The way that everything that you saw on the show and how smooth it was would not have been that same way. Did they understand me? No, if I say girl, it better be like, girl, no, I'm not saying it in a regular way. I want you to voice it and I want the captions to reflect me saying girl, right? And I want that attitude there. And so that's what I mean when it comes to accessibility. What that person needs has to be followed. Because it could be about culture. Like, let's use religion as an example. If we're talking about a Christian Baptist person, you wouldn't want a Jewish interpreter there or someone who's a Buddhist. You know, it would have to be someone that specifically matches that need. If we're talking about a social worker and we have an interpreter who only knows certain things about the science field, right? So that has to be very specific. And when people are watching the show, you know, you can definitely see the impact it has on having an interpreter there the way that I had it. Because I see a lot of people say that the way that I show my body language and how I sign, the words that they hear matches. And I literally heard someone say that, Raven, it felt like I was listening to you actually saying it. And for me, that was access. Yes, I've had the same experience with interpreters, and I'm unsure if they're really a good fit for me or understand what I'm saying. For example, I like to joke around a lot, but sometimes the interpreter will deliver it with this flat voice, and people are like, wait, is she joking? Is she not? They're unsure. We're all confused, and it makes me freeze up in the moment, and it becomes such an awkward situation. It's like, yeah, I was trying to tell a joke. And I think it was about 2020, I believe, my mom and I posted a video about our frustrations with Instagram and the platform not providing captioning. In fact, a lot of deaf people were frustrated with Instagram and their lack of accessibility. Like if I wanted to watch my favorite social media influencer or my favorite actor and their posts are in spoken English, I couldn't understand what they were saying. 
But then finally, Instagram added captions, and that was because we had to push the issue and ask for it. So why didn't they think of access in the first place? I think that's a really important point, too. Shelly, you work in film, you're very active on social media and Instagram and on YouTube. From your perspective, how does social media benefit the deaf community? Well, whether it's a movie, television show, any medium, typically the people who are writing and revising the scripts and making decisions are hearing people based on their biases, their thoughts and opinions. It's not really their place to tell stories and represent deaf people because they have never experienced deaf people's frustrations or setbacks. So why social media is so beneficial and different for the deaf community is deaf creators are in charge. We make decisions about our content, so there's no middle person, no filters. We can decide whatever we want to post or share or comment. We can create whatever we want. And that's why I really love social media, as it creates access to our very diverse deaf community. Yeah, and you were just talking about hearing people are responsible for that editing purposes. And my husband also is a part of this industry. You know, his title is still to be determined. But he works as a consultant, as a producer. And one thing, you know, this recent project was really focusing in on advocating for backtrack translation. The problem that we tend to have with deaf representation on the screen thus far is the actors sign their lines that they have in the script, and there's a translation happening from what's on English in the script into American Sign Language. And then the subtitles follow the original script, and it doesn't always work. So my husband really emphasizes the importance of watching the ASL and back translated into English, which is subtitled more smoothly. It's more seamless that way. And he really brought that back because we need more deaf people who work behind the camera, you know, in the editing room, working on subtitles, being a producer. In our survey, we asked people about obstacles and we found that live entertainment provided the biggest barriers. Um, there was stand-up comedy, live theater, and also actually captioning for films. So Eric, let me ask you as, a, as an advocate, what obstacles have you faced and how do you think we could break down these barriers? I feel that these are two different categories. For movie screenings, maybe you saw in the press that Marley Matlin was a juror on a jury for Sundance and she was trying to see a movie with closed captions and the device failed. It wasn't the filmmaker's fault. It was the fault of the organizers who didn't make sure that they were functioning devices. I think with movies in general, technically it's easy. Typically movies already have captions available. Most movies do, it's mainstream. But when it has to be turned on, the closed captioning devices need to be maintained. And that's complicated work. We don't have technicians at every movie theater taking care of the devices. So the problem is ingrained. For live, that's a different beast. Getting interpreters and everything, there's a longer communication process. For example, two days ago, I have a metalworking group of friends and they were fighting to get an interpreter for this three hour thing, but they failed. They weren't willing due to cost. And I think that's the challenge with live organizations or organizations that do live events. They feel very cost conscious, too cost conscious, you know, and uh, they don't know how to navigate that and get the access that's needed. They don't know the other options like pro bono interpreting, getting someone to, you know, provide a script of what to do, how to provide access for people in live events. It's available, but it takes a lot more work and every show is unique. I also made a video about that in the past because I realized that many times when it came to these different live events that were happening, they have their flyers, they'd have their videos that they would use to, pr to promote their events, my ad captions, you know, which is great. You're showing off the events, but they should also be adding a contact person because if I want to request an interpreter, who do I reach out to? How do I contact them? You know, just adding that statement of or accommodations and just figuring out making the request for interpreter. Do I make the request to the venue? Do I make the request to Ticketmaster? 
who am I supposed to reach out to? I contact one person. They tell me, oh, we don't handle that. This person does. I ask them. They say, we don't handle that. Ask this person. I ask that person. They say, oh, we don't provide interpreters. We'll give you captions. And they think, well, oh, we're not going to provide interpreters because deaf people don't show up. Well, no, deaf people don't show up because you're not providing the access. And so if I'm watching you make a video promoting your event without captions, how will I know? And, you know, I want to go, but you're not providing access. Do I want to go through that struggle? No, I'll just drop it and not go. So you don't see deaf people there because it's not accessible. It's not that we don't want to or that we're not interested. Yeah, a while ago you were asking about what really does accessibility look like. And I think that makes me think about how accessibility truly requires honest conversations. And I feel like that's what's happening right now in the acting world, you know, on Broadway specifically. Myself, when I first started acting on Broadway, I have to admit, I did not go see a lot of Broadway shows, truly, because it wasn't truly accessible. But what I see now is there's continuing conversations about that and seeing attempts. It's not 100% successful. Recently, I think there was a debacle with bringing in an interpreter who was not the appropriate interpreter for the show and with actors who not truly understanding what subtitled subtitling devices actually look like. And then they just stop the show because this, they think this deaf person's using their phone, but it's, and they thought they were recording the show, but it was subtitling. So there's a long, a long way to go, truly, in regards to the theatrical experiences. But I think what the most important thing is, is that conversations are happening now and that should lead to change. We've been talking about representation and diversity. I want to take some time here at the end to think a little bit about the future. 63% of the deaf respondents in our survey says that they believe that Hollywood does perpetuate negative stereotypes about deaf people. So Shaley, you represent the future here. Let me ask you, how can we start to do better? How can we get on the right path when it comes to deaf people and getting rid of these negative stereotypes that we see? How can we change things for the better? Well, as an actor, I am often cast as a sweet, innocent girl, sometimes with a little sass, but I have felt frustrated with these casting choices. It's great to have roles, but it does seem a bit of a stereotype. It might seem like not a problem, but then the audience starts to think, well, what's so interesting about these deaf characters? You know, I've met a lot of deaf people and not everyone's sweet and innocent. Some are and some aren't. You never know. But in terms of the Hollywood screen, there are three big stereotypes I'd like to see removed. First is lip reading. There's this myth that we can magically read everyone's lips and it's so frustrating. It's like, no, we can't. Personally, I can't lip read at all. There's maybe a one or two percent chance that I'm able to catch what's being said, especially if I'm used to someone's mouth movement patterns, but most of the time I can't. In terms of working with hearing co-actors in the script, I have to memorize the other actor's lines because I want to be prepared for the scenes with dialogue to turn take smoothly. The second stereotype is that deaf people are often depicted communicating with animals, which is not true. We use our language, American Sign Language, to communicate with one another, where animals communicate in their own way. The third stereotype is we often see deaf people depicted all alone. Through the entire movie or show, they're by themselves. And when I see this, I'm like, no! In my experience, deaf people love being around each other and we'll talk and talk as long as we can. If we're supposed to leave at 6.30, we'll still be there at 7 and way later having fun, playing with our friends and talking. So how to make changes in media is to stay away from these stereotypes by hiring more deaf producers, more deaf writers, more deaf people behind the camera, and of course, more deaf actors. So I think all of those points are key. In our survey, 83% of deaf people said they needed to see more deaf people work behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. Michael, let me ask you, what role do audiences play? Do governments play? Do producers play? What can they do to provide more access and open more doors for deaf people in the industry? Governments need to close the loopholes. It's like I was saying before. The ADA was developed for television and cable. That's it. Not the internet, not streaming. There are laws that require captioning, but that's for broadcast television. They don't apply to streamers. 
And so that's one big change we need to see. We need to see an update in these laws to understand and include new technology. When it comes to audiences, our support comes in the form of buying tickets. We have to go see movies featuring people with disabilities, right? Many producers say, oh, you know, we need to write for white audiences because they assume that all the money is coming from white people going to see movies. They're the ones with the money, right? But this, that's not true. I mean, one of the most profitable franchises, right, is Fast and the Furious. There aren't white people in that. Not in the lead roles. That was unexpected, right? People thought, no one's going to come see these films, but obviously people did. They, they made a fortune. And that proves that you can do it. Not just white content will be successful. Coda proved that you could tell stories about deaf people that could win awards and earn money. So that's one thing audiences can do. If you were to do a survey and ask people, what do you want to see in films? They're going to say they want to see diversity. But as a white cis male with power, are you really using your power to say, I want to see more movies with people with disabilities? with wheelchair users, like that. Producers. Producers need to be familiar with, let me see how to say this. They, they don't need to just understand the deaf experience, but they need to be familiar with it. They need to have spent some time with deaf people. That's what's important. You can't just say, oh, we're going to hire a bunch of consultants, and that'll get us there. Like, we've got a deaf character? No problem. we got a bunch of consultants. We're good. Oh, no. We need to be honest, right? If you want change, if we want to see diversity, we need to hire a more diverse group of production assistants, more people at the entry level. We have to. If the union is serious about diversity, they need to have a more diverse membership. And they need to find ways of reaching out to new people. If they say they want to make a change, they got to prove it. We have enough examples of successful deaf content, right? So now we need to see what happens next. What's the next step? It's been proven. That's done. Now we need to move on from it, right? We need to build on the work that deaf actors have done, that deaf writers have done, that everyone has done up until this point. We need to see what's next. Daniel, you've opened a lot of doors. What role do you want to play? What stories do you want to tell moving forward? What is your vision of deaf representation on stage and screen? Well, really, I picture in the future, I know that we have so many stories out there. What's happening with the deaf community inside and out, and not only that, there are so many diverse stories within deafness, BIPOC people, we need to bring more of our stories. CODA was all white, so we've told our story. We need to tell more different stories about different families. I wanna see more diversity on screen and just more different kinds of deaf characters. Again, no pitying the deaf person and a deaf character on screen. I want the audience to feel like they felt watching CODA, seeing a deaf family and not feeling bad that they were deaf. They were just enjoying this family. And at the same time, they learned more about deaf culture and they got to enjoy this story at the same time. So how do we bring that together, the deaf world and the hearing world, to let audiences enjoy it at the same time about us? So we, I wanna see more content there. Jessica, you were involved in our survey and you said something really interesting, was very powerful. You said that we should be relieved of the burden of creating accessibility. Can you tell us a little more about that and how you see that happening moving forward? Yes. Now, what I meant by that was, is that people need to realize most frequently, and I'm sure everyone here on the panel's experienced it, but when we enter a space that's dominated by hearing folks, we typically are the first deaf person that these hearing people have ever met which means we are then obligated to explain how to communicate with us, where to find an interpreter. 
and a whole host of other issues that we educate the hearing person on about how to make sure that the interpreter is a good fit for us, to make sure that things are captioned. I mean, there's so much educating that takes place when really what we should be able to do is focusing on what we're good at and why we're there to write, to act or direct or whatever our role and function is in that space. But oftentimes what we end up doing is educating and reminding, right? Sometimes we have to remind them of what we've educated them about. And that takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of mental energy. So my suggestion would be, why do we not prepare in advance for these things? Why don't we already have interpreters at the live show? You know, why don't we just provide it? Why is the captioning just not automatically provided? I'm sure all of you have experienced this as well in your past, but I've missed out on plenty of an opportunity because I didn't have the energy to self-advocate again. I was too tired, you know? I was too frustrated. I didn't have the time to go through the basic education of what it means to work with a deaf person again. And sometimes it feels like we're born to become teachers to hearing folks that we never signed up to be a teacher for. So it's exhausting. And I'll do it. I'll do it for the community. I'll do it. But at the same time, I just need a break from it sometimes. So why not prepare in advance? Not at the moment the deaf person's been cast. That's when you're trying to figure it all out. No, do it proactively. Do it now. Assemble your team of interpreters now or figure out how you're going to provide the captioning now before we get to the job site. Because when people surprise me and they already have the accommodation there, it's magical, it's inspirational, and I finally feel welcome. You know, it's like, just welcome us, everybody. It's real simple. Okay, it's about time for us to wrap up. So I'd like to go around the horn here. In one or two sentences, can you tell us about your hopes and your predictions for the next few years in regards to representation and accessibility for deaf people in the media? Well, in general, like I said before, I want to see more diversity in union membership. I want to see other deaf people, anyone, set designers, anyone in my office. That's it. That, that's what I want. I want more deaf people in my place of business. I'm really happy to see all of you here sharing your stories. And I think it's important for all of us and for people who might be watching this to understand and strongly believe that we belong here. We have, we have the right to occupy this space. This is ours. There's no way to feel, we don't need to feel lucky or grateful to be where we are right now. Really, I wanna thank everyone here and thank you for making this happen. I love seeing the connection we've all built and how we understand. And I always have to remind myself that we experience oppression through different ways. And at the same time, I have to understand that they don't see deaf people this often. No one does. It's rare for deaf people to be out there and to get together. So the world needs to understand what we're doing and what we've gone through. And they need to relate to us more so we can partner up and have fun in the future. I've learned so much just from being here on this panel already. And I want more of these conversations to happen with deaf people. So I really will hope that continues in the future that we can have this dialogue, but also have, see the action and change occur too. Because I really, want to be on a side of change for future and it can happen you know it's not a hard thing to make something accessible you just have to be willing open-minded and have an open heart to welcome it i'm a captioning advocate so i want to tell hearing people to be as open-minded as possible about captions turn them on on your tv get an understanding of why deaf people benefit from them and make them a part of your life too I've enjoyed hearing all of your stories and I hope we continue the conversation as well. 
Well, in terms of the future, just surprise me. Just surprise me, everybody. If I show up and the interpreter's ready, I'll be like, wow, they did it. My gosh. So, yes, just be open-minded and willing to hear us out. And don't be afraid to ask us. You know, everyone's different. And most of the time we welcome those questions. So please ask us and surprise us. What I'm hoping to see in the next few years is that deaf actors could be cast in any role, in any genre, in any type of movie. My biggest dream is to play Rapunzel in a live action Tangled because both of us are adventurous, eager, sweet and smart, brave and curious. I can relate to the character being locked in a tower deprived of her freedom by Mother Gothel who won't let her out. I feel that some hearing people can be like that, telling me I can't have those roles because I can't hear, which seems so unfair. Imagine if I was out of the tower and free. It's amazing how many possibilities one story could have, right? So I also enjoyed all of your comments today and it was nice to meet everybody. Mm -hmm.